How's it going guys? I am Fulkerman, your local Brick Built Historian, with another episode of Brick Built History. Today we are taking a look at the Mitsubishi A6M0. So this is another Brick Mania kit, and this is probably one of my personal favorite aircraft for the Japanese side. Mostly, well, they also have a lot of other good aircraft, but this aircraft is just so famous that there's no denying that this is probably one of the most influential Japanese aircraft of the entire war, of probably all time, honestly. But let's get into the review and then get into the history. So we have the box here. You have A6M20, World War II fighter, 390 Lego and Brick Warrior elements with one minifig, designed by Cody Ocell. A nice three-quarter profile shot. You have the manufacturer's plate with all of this again. Brick Mini Kit 2289, 3 out of 5 skill level. And then a nice, nice monochromatic image on the back. So, move that to the side. Let's take a look. Not only the A6M2, but the A6M5. So, both of these are very, very similar aircraft. Because, well, it's it, it, it's the same aircraft. Uh, there are some minor differences. Obviously, this one is green, and this one is white. Well, technically, it's supposed to be light gray, but maybe they don't make that. So, you know, deal with what you can make. Uh, but they're both really, really cool. So move this one off to the side for now as we take a look at the a6m2 so first thing you'll see is the free spinning propeller this uh gray nose cap i really like this uh way of making radial engine uh cowlings because it, it just looks so so awesome like, just, I am i don't know, it, there's something, like, really cool about the way that Cody's making these cowlings. As you can see, there's a brick-built canopy over here, which makes it kind of difficult to take the minifigure in and out, which is with any brick-built canopy. Although this one's a little easier because you have these two clips you can pop up, but... Of course, Lando has an awesome minifigure in there that I am too lazy to take out. Down here, you have an air intake. You have landing gear that can fold up. You got the typical meatballs, as they call them, on the wings. These ones are printed, while these ones are stickers. And then you have the red stripe on the back here. It's an early war model. So this is something that will be flying through Pearl Harbor. And uh, no, these didn't really bomb Pearl Harbor, like in Pearl Harbor. The valves and the Kates are the ones that did the bombing. This did the escorting and the strafing. You can have, you see the uh, wing mounted cannons here. There's implied cow mounted machine guns in there, which is fine in a really good job of getting this tail section because that is probably the most significantly different part of a zero which I'll get lay into later in the history the A6M5 of course is very similar meatball stickers here these are printed and then these are stickers on the back here the canopy is black the antenna is black, the propeller is brown now, and everything is green on top, gray on the bottom. So, you know, same aircraft, just different colors, really. Honestly, the, the whole reason I got these two zeros is because of the fact that you have like an early war and a late war model. 
in Japanese aircraft are just very interesting. Maybe, hopefully, sometime I can get the, uh, uh, crap, forgot what it was, the, uh, Hayate. And maybe, hopefully, someday they'll make a Val or, or a Kate or even a Betty. So, yeah, that would be, uh, that'd be really cool. There's not a lot of Japanese aircraft that are made. So, because everyone makes a zero. Everyone, everyone knows a zero. But hopefully sometime we can get some more. Uh, this one is probably still going to be coming out. This is their newer model. This one is retired. This is the one I got from the vault, which is why I don't have a, I don't have a uh, box for it. Um, oh yeah, I forgot to mention. This one has uh, the puffy printed exhaust on the side of the cowling here. Which I kind of wish they would do on that one. Maybe, uh, maybe when they do an update, that'd be cool. But the these are very awesome kits. Uh, the you can't go wrong with the Zero. The Zero is a perfectly, perfectly good Japanese aircraft. So if you're interested in Japanese aircraft, definitely check this one out. So let's get into the history. And this one probably will be longer because I have a lot of history written down for this because I'm just so interested in these. So these are were introduced in the year 1940 or the year 2600 in the Imperial Japanese calendar, which is where it gets its name. So in Japan, it's actually known as the Navy Type Zero Carrier Fighter or the Rei Shiki Kanjo Sentoki, aka the Rei Sen, which Rei Sen is zero fighter, uh, because they take the two zeros from the 2600, and that's where it gets its name, zero. The allies would actually give it the official name of Zeke, but they would use the term zero, uh, a whole lot more than they would Zeke. Uh, if you don't know, the way that Americans, or mostly Americans, but the Allies would classify Japanese aircraft because Japanese is a completely different language. So, kind of like how today Soviet fighters are start with an F, like the fish bed, the fulcrum, all that. In World War II, Japanese, the Japanese aircraft, the fighters were given male names, like Zeke, Oscar, George, Rex, and the bombers were given female names, like Val, Betty, you know, so on and so forth. So this would actually have the official name Zeke, which is a male name, for being a fighter. Uh, it's, it is a very weird thing, because the A6M it's also a has a weird connotation because the A stands for a carrier aircraft. So any carrier aircraft starts with an A. Like the uh, a, like the the A five M that this replaced, it was a carrier based aircraft. The six is the sixth model for the for the carrier fighters. And then the M stands for Mitsubishi. So, like the B5N, Kate, is made by Nagasaki. Anything that ends with an A is Aishi. So on and so forth. So, if you're looking at something and you wonder, like, wh who made it? Basically, M, Mitsubishi, N, Nagasaki. And, uh, uh, A for Aishi. There's N, I. I don't remember what that one is, but... You know, their designations seem to be very, very, uh, simple. Uh, this was originally designed by Jiro Horikoshi, who was a very young engineer in the Mitsubishi factory. And he was, he was, he was one of those guys who was just fascinated by, air, by aircraft, by flying. Uh, if you've ever seen the Studio Ghibli film, The Wind Rises, it's loosely based on his life. Uh... But Jiohiro Koshi, whenever he went into this design, 
The Japanese really needed a few things. They needed something that was fast, that was maneuverable, and could go a long distance. In fact, this aircraft would hold basically the record for the longest ranged single engine aircraft throughout the entire war. There was really no aircraft that could like keep up with this because it could it could go around eleven hundred to twelve hundred miles easily. So <laughs> it's it, it it's quite phenomenal for being a small plane that it is. Uh, the way it did that was being light, so it it would give up a lot of kind of what we would think as basic things. Uh the like the infamous non uh non self sealing fuel tank. They would give that up in for weight. They would give up hydro like simple hydraulics. They would give up a lot just to keep the weight down, to allow more fuel, and to allow it to go farther. So the A six M two here would be powered by a Nakajima NK-1C Sakai 12 14-cylinder radial engine, so uh, with 940 horsepower. Now, if you don't know about radial engines, the pistons have to be an odd number. So if you hear a even number, it's usually a dual-layer engine, kind of like in this aircraft. So it has seven cylinders on the first, set and then it has a second set of cel seven cylinders behind it. Uh, every every radial engine is like that and you can just keep on stacking cylinders back like I think it was Pratt and Whitney who had like a full like it was like a 30 some cylinder engine just going back which is crazy tons of horsepower but this thing had 940 horsepower which would give it 331 miles per hour top speed. Uh, in the early war, these things would have a 12 to 1 kill ratio, which is in absurd. But whenever you get to the A6M5 region, it started to get outpaced by a lot of Allied fighters. Uh, mostly because you couldn't really fit a bigger engine. Uh, by the A6M2, I believe, or the A6M3, they put in Nakajima Sake 21 with 1100 horsepower and a two speed supercharger. But it could only go 351 miles per hour, which really wasn't that much of a difference. They also shortened the wings, which in the Lego form, these have the same exact wingspan, but you know, kind of hard to display that with Lego. Uh, they also got rid of the folding, the wing folding aspect, which isn't shown in any of these. It wouldn't be shown in this, but this would lay probably about here. The wing tips would fold up for carrier stowage, uh, which, I mean, with how thin this is and having this taper here, it's virtually impossible to do that. Uh, one of the one of the weirdest things is how the reputation that these zeros would have, because it it was said never dogfight a zero, especially if you're in a Hellcat or a Wildcat. Uh, never dogfight a zero, and it wasn't until around midway when a guy by the name of Thatch created something called the Thatch Weave, where you basically have two sets of people going and then they would cross to help like this guy knock out the zero behind him so tactics really helped out the Americans when it came to defeating the zero so that 12 to 1 kill ratio instantly flipped whenever the Americans came out with better tactics the other thing was that in the early war Japanese pilots had around 2,000 flight hours of experience, especially flying in China. The average American had less than 10%, uh, uh, or yeah, around less than 10% of that. They would have like 200 flight hours. But by the end of the war, America would 
would trade their pilots out, bring back the experience, send out some new ones to the experience one would train the new ones, yada yada yada. The Japanese, some of, some of their pilots literally flew out in the front from the beginning of the war to the end of the war, which is absolutely crazy. So, the thing about the Zero, it was known for being fast and being maneuverable. And one thing, one design feature that really toned to this is this tail end right here. So this tail end, it's just a fascinating thing because you don't see this in anything else. So the, the vertical stabilizer here, where the rudder is, extends all the way back compared to where the horizontal stabilizer is. Now the reason this happens is because they've, the Jiro Hirokoshi figured out that whenever you're doing a maneuver, the air from the vertical, from the horizontal stabilizer could affect your vertical stabilizer. It would disrupt it and you wouldn't be able to use it. But if you have these up here, your, your uh, vertical stabilizer is completely out of the, completely out of the range of the d disrupted air from the horizontal stabilizer, which was a big advantage. But eventually, whenever you get things like the Vought F4U Corsair into the mix, it quickly loses its advantage. So, I mentioned the 20 millimeter cannons on the wings here. So it would have two 20 millimeter Type 99 Mark One or Mark II uh, cannons. It would also have two 7.7 millimeter Type 97 machine guns in the cow wings up here, and could carry two 60 kilogram bombs or a fixed 250 kilogram bomb if it's doing a kamikaze mission. Now these are also known for its kamikazes even though the majority of them were probably Oscars. But, you know, the whole thing about the, Jap like the Japanese Air Force is they think of two things, Pearl Harbor and kamikazes. So of the 10,939 of these that were made, only... Mm, there is quite a few that survived, although most of them are built from a bunch of other planes put together. Which is kind of common, once you think about it, but not a lot of full-blown, pure, like, same-frame zeros are, are around. So in the end, the Zero really turned out to be quite the influential fighter. It was way more advanced than any American fighter, really. Any Allied fighter. Uh, no one really knew that Japan could make such a such an aircraft and it really baffled the Allies for a long time until around 1943 whenever they figured whenever they finally f flipped the tides on Japan so with that said make sure you watch that movie The Wind Rises it is a great movie <laughs> but if you learn something hit a like subscribe for more Write in the comments what you would like to see me do a review on. And with all that said, I've been Pockerman, and let's continue to build history.